All right. So, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the So Weird Podcast, our final episode for season one. We're ending this season with episode 13, Will of the Wisp. I'm Kat. I'm Kathy. I'm Emily. <laughs> I'm Zach. And this episode is about Fiona in Texas. She's going after the Marfa light phenomenon, where she does not see a Marfa light herself, but one possesses Jack. And I think it's uh, clever how they use the Marfa lights as a way to bring the Will o' the Wisp into the story. But even you know that's traditionally a European phenomenon, but they found a clever loophole there with. Marfa lights and other spook light phenomenons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was really interesting that on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, they actually did it uh, an episode where they talked about the Marfa lights, which I thought was interesting to tie into So Weird. I was going to say, I'm from Texas, but I had never heard of Marfa lights. And I still haven't, like, talking to people from here. Maybe it's just a uh, West Texas thing since Marfa's over there, but I don't know if it's a popular thing now or maybe it was just back then. Well, Marfa, from my understanding, is a really small town, and it's funny that you mentioned Unsolved mm-hmm. Mysteries, Kat, because there's really nothing unsolved about this one. I mean, it's been pretty much tested. The Marfa lights are reflections of uh, car headlights from the nearby freeway. In fact, most spook or light phenomenons. Well, <laughs> I mean, people can <laughs> choose to believe whatever they want, but that's what the evidence points to. Yeah, and I've even seen on so weird message boards in the past people debating whether Marfa lights is even a true legend because of that. So I'm glad you brought up the real explanation. Fiona definitely wouldn't go for it, though. <laughs> <laughs> so this episode, I think, is notable because the mystery doesn't even concern Fee half as much as it concerns her brother Jack. And I think Jack... Patrick Levis, who plays Jack, he deserves all of the awards for his performance as the Will of the Wisp Brickro. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. agree with Kat. I think he does... I don't know. He showcases all his talent here. You don't um, think it's just a little over the top? Not at all. I don't all, think it's over the top. <laughs> it's supposed to be a character who's over the top. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. I think he was... He did an excellent job, and when I was younger, like, this was my first experience watching a show where someone was acting like they were possessed and he had me totally convinced i was very creeped out by it yeah i think it's very impressive how he was able to maintain a scottish accent so well in this episode um okay (laughs) Uh, i I, the accent is a little silly the accent's a little silly (laughs) well the character brickery was a little silly I mean, well, he's supposed to be this evil creature, but he's not evil half as much as he just likes to create amusement for himself. He's almost like a trickster in a sense. Yeah, in RPG terms, we would describe him as chaotic neutral. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to say something else about the accent real quick. I would agree that his accent, it kind of fades in and out. Like, it's not constantly Scottish or, you know, constantly... American, it kind of like goes back and forth. And I think that just adds, like, I'm not saying this is intentional by any means, but it kind of adds another layer to his character because he's so fake. Yeah, it's like a mask. Um, I've said this before, like in live streams, how this Brick Crew character reminds me of another character from the show Once Upon a Time, and that's uh, Rumpelstiltskin because when he acts... Because so uh, Rumpel is has two personalities basically the regular real real world which is just like you know regular guy and then the fairy tale version which is very a caricature uh, he has different lit of his voice is very much like Rick Ruse, but it also fades in and out like when he's being extra over the top extra fake that's when it, you know the voice is extra just too much I guess and. There's deals that Brick Room makes, and he has a nickname for Fiona. He calls her Little Duck all the time. and I really like those type of characters and those type of caricatures. So well, that's a- why I really like Brick Room, and I like how we get to see him at least two other times in the series. Well, there is a tradition of you know the fairies as 
characters that are not really evil, but are mischievous, if not outright amoral towards human concerns, and they do always like to make deals, and, you know, this is definitely um, an older bit of mythology that's so weird is playing with in this one. And it's interesting that you bring up Rumpelstiltskin, because there's that great line in this episode where Fiona's trying to right. guess yeah. the name of the Will of the Wisp, because by getting his name, he'll be able to have power over him, and thus vanquish him from Jack's body. And the creature gives her hint, it's not Rumpelstiltskin, with a laugh track in the back. <laughs> yeah, because that's basically the fairy tale of his. Yeah, and I also like how you brought up this notion of having a mask where he gets a little too over the top. Because as he's conversing with Fee, and Fee's trying to get information about what this creature is and what it wants, they have this contest where Fiona asks it a question, and then the creature can ask Fiona a question. And one of the questions is about if he has brothers and sisters, and he goes on this little tirade about, oh yes, I remember my dear mother, snowy white hair, her kind <laughs> face, and then Fiona calls him out, face and hair, aren't Will the Wisp just balls of light? And so <laughs> they are, I guess I made the whole thing up. Yeah, it's complete bullshit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then later on, he says he's from the Nexus, but if he's from the Nexus, why does he have a Scottish accent anyway? Like, I know in the legend, they're from Scotland, or they originate from Scotland, but if he's not mm -hmm. even from this world, why does he have an accent like that? Well, I want to bring up the Scottish connection, because um, I did some wikiing. Uh, wikiing? Sure, I did some <laughs> wikiing. And um, Brickrew is actually a character from Irish mythology. But throughout the episode, the character refers to himself as a spunky, which is a Scottish term. So I guess the writers just threw all of uh, Eastern Europe or Eastern British Isles into a cauldron together with, on this one. And I think the little story he mentions about some guy named Fergus getting tricked into going into a bog or something. I think that was actually part of the real legend of Brick Crew, too. Yes, and every time I watch Brave, all I can think of is this episode of So Weird. Yeah, same. <laughs> I didn't first... know Brickrew was a real tale or a real myth. Yeah, he's a character from the... Uh, oh, I'm going to say this wrong. Uh, my uh, ancient Irish is not up to snuff. He's a character from the legend of Cú Colain, which is a Irish hero of legend, kind of a comparable to a character like Hercules or something like that, sort of this warrior that all these tales and legends have been told about. Oh, I always thought the writers made up that name. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm glad you learned that connection. That's interesting. Yeah. it's uh, Like I said, I'm, I, I, literally all I know about it, I'm reading off of the Wikipedia article right here. So, <laughs> um, And this was the first time I had ever heard. When I saw, first saw this episode years and years and years ago, whenever it first aired, this was the first time I had ever heard of the Will of the Wisp. I'd never, I was not familiar with this phenomenon before I saw this episode. Yeah, same. I also didn't know it was a real legend until I started seeing it in other shows and movies and all that. So yeah. will the wisps are, like in the legend, they really do possess people? Is that true? Um, it's not so much the wisps specifically possessing people. That's just a kind of a thing fairies do. But this idea of these ghost lights and these little sparks of light leading people into bogs and lakes and things, that is a common legend. Gotcha. Yeah, and uh, for extra nerd points, there's also a Spider-Man villain named the Will of the Wisp. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like it mo has more, the actual Will of the Wisp legend has more in common with the Harry Potter creature. I think it's the Kappa that lures people into a box, help them get lost and mess well, with people. Yeah, well, well, the Kappa is a Japanese thing, but... Uh, oh, but... Still same concepts? Well, no, I mean, a Kappa is a turtle monster that uh, lives in, they live in um, lakes and uh, sometimes they're mischievous. They like to steal people's belly buttons who go swimming in the lake, but sometimes they are um, deadly. They do drown people. But the thing with Kappas is if you feed them a cucumber, that will keep them pacified, which is why the sushi rolls with cucumber in them are called Kappa rolls. Wow, how did you learn all this? The most I ever learned about Kappas was from Harry Potter. Uh, you know, I've always had a brain for trivia, and uh, I've always liked <laughs> monsters, so I've read a lot of stuff. Alright, nice to the hear. More, you know, we're learning a lot. 
And <laughs> yes, we are. And going back to this particular monster, I think it's interesting how it brings out a lot of character development between Jack and Fee as they create this deal where the creature is trying to get information from Fee about how to be like the real Jack to lose the accent and make it clear that he is a human even though he's really not. And we get to see all these little clips throughout the season of how Fee and Jack have interacted. Yeah, which is a good character beat. And I don't want to sound like I'm being too negative here because I do like this episode a lot. But I've always wondered if setting the majority episode in this place called the Nexus, which is fog and green lights, and then showing a lot of footage from previous episodes, I always wondered if this was like a cost-saving measure. You know, the last episode of the season, maybe they need to save a little money and they have to think of a cheap way to get an episode out there. Always wondered that. Well, it's possible. I mean, that would make a lot of sense. And I remember, um, well, P Patrick Levis did an interview, and there, it's actually up on the So Weird forum, and he talked about filming this episode, and he said he was sitting in front of uh, the black curtains for about a week filming this one. <laughs> yeah, I definitely remember. I've read somewhere that was so weird because they did use so many special effects that they did have to have episodes just as, such as this one and also the season two episode Encore where it was more of a clip show and it was a cost-saving measure for them. Yeah, and this isn't a clip show, but it does use footage from previous episodes. I mean, usually when you bring up the topic of clip show, TV fans roll their eyes. Oh, you know, we hate the clip shows because they're such a, a cheap way to fill out the season. But um, this is, it's not really a clip show, but it does feature a lot of footage from previous episodes. Yeah, and I really like the way this episode handles it because you can see Jack and Fiona watching themselves, even though it's not really Jack, but you can see Fiona looking back at the way she and Jack have interacted and she almost comes to tears at some points, looking back at the moment from Singularity, when she told Jack that she loved him, when she wasn't sure if she would make it through the wormhole alive. That's really sweet. Yeah, anytime they, uh, I, I've said this before, anytime Fee cries or almost cries, it's always a good moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so what do we think of how Bricku acts with the other characters, like Clue and Molly and all them? Well, one thing I'm glad this episode did was they get uh, Fiona and, and Jack to this Nexus place pretty quickly because I feel like if they hadn't, the other characters would have noticed that something was up. Yeah. yeah, they already clearly started to notice something was up because Jack is way too into eating his bagel. <laughs> and he's using, like, a pillar as a back scratcher. And Clue just kind of goes along with it, like, Oh, cool. We can use it as a back scratcher and follows along. That seems in character. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like that scene. <laughs> but he couldn't have kept it up forever. And that's why he needed Fiona's help with learning how to be more like Jack. And what is that line where Jack slash Brickrew is talking to somebody while they're outside of that little shop? He tells like a little story or something, right? Yes. That where... was a good moment. He's with Clue, and it's like a poem by Robert Burns, I think. Mm -hmm. It talks who's about a, spunkies in it. Yeah, who's a Scottish poet. Yeah, and he said, um, Clue said, wasn't he the guy that wrote the lyrics to the dead? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Grateful Dead, and then Brickrew said, no, that was Orpheus. Yes, oh yeah, that's a great, great, uh, the English majors are going to love that joke. The... Uh, minstrel who went into the underworld to rescue his girlfriend and then I think gets crushed with rocks in the end. Oh, okay. That's a <laughs> joke that very particular uh, group will like, I guess. Well, th this episode is just full of all sorts of little story threads. <laughs> yes, including the chance for Fee to find out what happened to her father, Rick towards the end when in trying to entice Fiona to stop trying to get control over him, Bricrio offers to give her a chance to speak with her father. That's such a heartstring pulling moment to watch me make that decision. Yes. And I remember watching that when I was younger, um, very clearly in my mind, even after I'd already seen the episode, I still watched that scene and like, you know, like I held my breath, like, Oh my God, is she going to actually do it this time? Is she going to like, <laughs> 
stop it. Oh, you know, it was so intense. <laughs> yeah. And it's a very interesting decision for Fiona because obviously reconnecting with her father is a serious goal of hers. So the fact that she does not agree to that is uh, it shows how strong a character she is. Definitely. And I think the fact that she, the reason why she doesn't agree to it is because she knows that Rikria was a malevolent force as entertaining as he is. Yeah, in a lot of ways, this episode sets up so much of what the show would do in season two. Yes. Yeah, and Brick Crew, he says, or he tells Fee that the two main questions that, you know, the whole audience has or the show presents itself uh, throughout season two is why Rick died and where he is now. That's what he tells Fee, like, don't you want to know why he died and where he is now? And, um... There are things that he wants her to know and that he he needs her to know. So it's like, what's going on? Like, there's more to this mystery than we thought. And that's how we enter season two. Yeah, and poor Fiona. At one point, Rick Ryu mentions that he comes from another world, the world of spirits. And then Fiona asks, the spirit world, is that where people go when they die? And then, of course, that's the moment where Brick Ryu has finished downloading Jack, so to speak. And he never answers the question. Yeah, and I love that moment because of the little tremble uh, Fiona gets in her voice. Yeah. Again, anytime, you know, Kara plays sad, I, I just love that. Those are my favorite moments. <laughs> Me too. Kara and Patrick did such a fantastic job in this episode. Mm -hmm. They brought out a lot of great acting in each other, I feel like, in that scene, or that sequence. Yeah, and also, it kills me that there is not a blooper reel for this show. <laughs> because I can only imagine what it would look like for this episode with all the props that Patrick was using. <laughs> There's a lot of dress-up in this one. Yes. Oh, and God, you know, not to get too political, but that moment where he's going on about how anybody can become president... <laughs> seems ruefully relevant right now. I yeah. know. I'm just like, oh my gosh, kudos to those writers. <laughs> yes, we should make campaign signs saying Brick Ryu for president. <laughs> oh, <God>. oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's perfect. Fiona can be our Secretary of State. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> Uh, so this is one episode I definitely remember very vividly. This was one I never forgot about. Um, I would say, like, along with Rebecca and Banshee, this was the so weird episode I would think the most about in the years between seeing the show for the first time and rewatching it. Um, especially the ending, always the, oh, I guess the climax was more appropriate, always stuck with me when Fiona totally cheats to win the bargain. Yes, yeah. what a great moment and triumph for technology. I know, I love how they do that and how they tie back technology, which is a big part of the show. It's the thing that Jack created, too, so in a way he's saving himself, too. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. I thought about that. So just to refresh on anybody's memory who's listening to this part and isn't quite sure what we're talking about, towards the end of the episode... When Fee realizes that she's running out of time to guess Brick Rue's name as she's trying to save her brother, she uses a computer program that scrambles through letters to help her and Jack cheat at Hangman when they play, one each, play each other online. And that piece of technology is able to guess Brick Rue's name given the letter, the riddle that Brick Rue gives her that it's seven letters long. Yeah, and I just don't know if that uh, technology actually, like, I mean, it probably is something that a computer could do, but I don't think it could do it that quickly. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, if she had more hints than just seven letters, that's that covers a lot of ground. I, I don't know if, a, you know, the processor in her 1999 laptop could handle that. <laughs> I think it must have had, like, a little guidance from Rick or something, because... You would think that for a name with seven letters, it would come up with like a list of names and she'd have to guess from the list or something. But it scrolls down to Brick Ryu. And part of it might be she guessed like one letter at a time. Yeah, like, that's what I mean. <laughs> she guessed like B, your name starts with B. He freaks out a little. Turn it off. I'll let you speak to your father. Well, yeah, the real reason is it's a great way to raise dramatic tension at the end of the episode. To see the letters scrolling through on the screen, it's a nice way to build up suspense. Yeah, and then the sirens in the background and all that. 
Yes. Yeah, I love the sound effects in the Nexus. You get like the laugh track. That's the only time I've ever liked a laugh track is when they're kind of mocking the talk show you yes. know, set up. And then right. you hear them all go, oh, whenever Fee starts like getting emotional. It's, yeah. It adds a little bit of humor to a, a sensitive scene. Yeah. Um, and that's another thing from, you know, ancient Irish and Scottish legends about fairies and such. If you know their true name, you have power over them. That's a troop that crops up in fantasy fiction over and over again. Um, and, you know, Brick Roo is kind of the closest thing Fiona would have to a reoccurring antagonist throughout the show. Yeah, and I yeah, love that the- he gives her that little warning at the end where, he, as a wisp, he comes back to her and says, remember the name because I'll be back. Yeah, I love that last line and how they actually went through with that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think I caught something in that scene. There's like, there's some kind of editing mistake or something. So when the wisp disappears, if you look behind on the wall it looks like the wall kind of either moves backward or forward. And I wonder if that's where they have the camera, like a hole for the camera in the wall. But I don't know. So like as the the wisp disappears, you kind of like either see a camera go back. I've I've never been able to tell, but there's something up with that scene. That's interesting that you bring that up because there's definitely an editing, editing mistake right at the end where, so when they went into the Nexus, he was screaming about Jack, and then Brickaroo freezes time and brings them into the Nexus. So once Brickaroo is gone from Jack's body, they're back in the real world. And Molly's just like, what? What are you screaming about Jack? And Fiona realizes that it's over, and the real Jack is back. So she goes over and hugs him. And in one shot, she's hugging him around his neck, and then it cuts to Molly's confused face, and then goes back to Jack hugging a uh, fee hugging Jack and her arms around his stomach instead of his neck. <laughs> Oops, continuity error. Oh well, these things happen. But yeah. you know, overall, the editing in this episode was top notch, especially in the Nexus with Brick Crew jumping around all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really like when uh, right before he starts talking about his mom, you can kind of see her sitting in the background, and then the light, like there's this bright light. And it's, sh- you know, it, the scene shifts to him standing right beside her. I don't know. Just little moments like that. It's really, it's really clever, I thought. Definitely, definitely help make Brickery feel more like a character from another world. Have those continuous cut, cut, cut to where he's jumping around from place to place constantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say throughout this episode, or, yeah, throughout most of the episode, we don't really know why Brick Crew came to possess Jack specifically. But um, once once Fee starts to get close to guessing his name, like, he suddenly becomes, like, serious and kind of menacing, saying that the spirits or whatever that they know about Fee and they know what she's up to and that they want her stopped. And so... Yeah, and then doesn't he also say something like, oh, I can protect you much better than your puny brother can? Mm-hmm. I thought that's interesting and kind of hints back to Jack's role as V's protector as this ancient reincarnated knight. Oh, yeah. Makes you wonder why they didn't try and possess V. Maybe they couldn't possess V? Well, that is an interesting point, but I mean, just from a, a narrative perspective, it wouldn't be as good because you wouldn't have somebody, you know, they wouldn't have that challenge there. So, like, later next season when they possess molly there's like it's like the spirits always want to play off of fee they like to see her squirm and they like to mess with her yeah no i totally agree i was just thinking maybe it's because i don't know she's protected in some way i don't know off limits for some reason (laughs) oh that's like a callback to the season three episode with brick where he describes annie as being (laughs) off limits (laughs) uh I'm, i'm looking at the um Wikipedia article here, and this is amusing. Apparently, um, I'm quoting right here from the Wikipedia synopsis. The writers of this episode had very little information on the area of Texas where Marfa is located. Uh, they show a wooded area, forest area, when in fact Marfa is actually located entirely by desert. The Marfa, Texas Chamber of Commerce and City Hall comment it, we got a big laugh out of the large forest that does not exist in our town. Yes. <laughs> I, I always thought that wiki description was odd. 
Well, there's there's no whoever, citation here, so it could be yeah. complete bunk. <laughs> it's probably Someone written by somebody from the internet. Yeah, they're like, what? What? I need to edit this. I'm from Marfa. <laughs> um, yeah, it's true. Probably not a lot of a uh, forest in that area of Texas. No, <laughs> in fact, it's pretty. The scene is pretty clearly shot in. Vancouver. I don't know, it looks, yeah, it looks Canadian. <laughs> the parks. Yep. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, I do like this episode. I, I, you know, when I first rewatched it, I'm reading, rereading my review here that I wrote two or three years ago, and I gave it a six, which is kind of low. What? Yeah, I think this one's a lot better than Whoa. that on, on rewatch. I think I was just sort of put off by Patrick Levis's acting in this one, and it what? is, it's very silly. <laughs> I, I guess I'm on the wrong side of history on this one, but I, I think it's a little over the top. No, it's over the top because Brickery was an over the top character. And Patrick Levis deserves all the awards for his acting in this episode. <laughs> He's phenomenal. Nobody can portray Brickery like Patrick Levis can. Even even the rewards in a non applicable fields, right? Like radio science. <laughs> yes. He deserves the awards in radio science. He deserves all the awards. All <laughs> Yeah, I think uh there's that chat that he did on the So Weird website that we have archived on the So Weird forum where I think they asked him like what's the most funnest episode that he's filmed the most so far. Most, most fun. <laughs> 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 and um, yeah he said it was this one which for sure but we, we do see him portray other characters in the show but what's coming to my mind right now is the season 3 episode where they go Carnival? to the circuit, yeah, Carnival. yeah, where he pretend mm -hmm. he's that psychic person. Oh, but oh, yeah, I'd forgotten about that too. <laughs> uh, Probably for the best. Yeah, just the traumatic <laughs> memories of season three—they're all gone. Um, but but he also said in that Zoog interview that um, this was the episode where he almost forgot he was acting, and again, it was because you know the, he was in a room with black curtains and a green light for about a week. Mm -hmm. and he said he was so into the character that by the end, his he said he got his mind fried from it. <laughs> yeah. So I I could tell that you know this was a role he he took pretty seriously. He definitely well, it's got obvious. Into it. It's obvious he's having a lot of fun. I mean, you can tell how much he's enjoying this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kudos to Kara for being able to keep a straight face and act like she's freaked out when that must have been hilarious to film. Well, like you said, there's a bloopers reel somewhere probably of. <laughs> Her yeah, and if anybody of... he worked on so weird is paying attention to this, and if you could leak that for us, that would be great. <laughs> uh, yeah, in that chat um, or some chat, they talked about how like, oh, can't wait for the bloopers for that episode, and it's like, what, what bloopers? <laughs> Every show has to have bloopers buried somewhere. Well, you know, usually uh, those the uh, the takes they don't use frequently just get thrown out and just destroyed, but. Yeah, or I, saved I would... and put on a DVD as an extra feature. <laughs> yeah, you know, any you any missing pay money for it. Any missing so weird footage out there, you know? Yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah. So, final thoughts on Will the Wisp? Oh, it's a pretty I like good it one. A lot. Yeah, I just like when they get into Rick and emotional aspects and Fee making hard decision, which we see again throughout season two. And how strong of a character she is to not give in so easily. And yeah, I would rate it an 8 out of 10. Um, well, you know, I do like this one. I like the interplay between Fiona and Jack. I like their chemistry. I think Brick Roo is, well, I think it's a great idea for them to bring in some sort of viable, visible antagonist for Fiona to play off of. And I like all the mythological stuff in this one. Um, I would probably give it a 7 out of 10. Um, I love this episode. Uh, for a while now, it's been my second favorite So Weird episode. Uh, I love Patrick Levis' performance. Um, I think the scene, the sequence in the Nexus is like one of my favorite moments in the entire show, along with the ending of Rebecca. Uh, I just, I love that whole sequence. Um, and um, I, I don't do ratings, as you know, but uh, I, I just, I really love this one. I like, there are even some, like, lines in this episode that I quote, which isn't typical for me, but I've incorporated them into, like, my daily life. <laughs> Not really, but uh, 
So from Brie Crew, like, quack, quack, little duck. I say that a lot to my sister. <laughs> and then um, there's this line, he says, very sarcastically, I weep for you. I do. And so I say that now. I know. So, yeah, it's had an impact on me in surprising ways. Oh, and I was just going to say, uh, you know, I think this was a great season finale, which we haven't really talked about. But um, I think that the it's clear to me that the main character arc in season one is the Jack and Fee relationship. And I think in season two, uh, it's uh, Fee's relationship with her parents. So I think this episode was perfect for the ending of season one. Well, that's, that's a good a really point. Good analysis. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that because it seems to me that the first season is much more episodic than the second season. But there is definitely that thread of Fiona and Jack and how they work with each other and play off of each other. That is, that's a good point. Yeah, it's such a yeah, shame I, they abandoned the plot line about Jack being a reincarnated knight. I'd never thought about yeah, season one being about Jack and Fee, but um, like in this episode, they show all the scenes between them, and I like how they show a scene in episode one where I believe the last scene in that episode was Jack telling Fee that he thinks about you know Rick also, and oh yeah, that's from the pilot. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to bring it full circle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It being about them two. And Rick also. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, they have some nice moments in season two, but the bulk of their relationship is built up in this season, I feel like. Uh, And then the second season, it's more about Fee's relationship with Molly and Rick. True. Yeah. um, But, uh, you know, so I'm I'm really looking forward to moving on to season two. I mean, I like, there's a lot of great episodes in season one. I enjoy season one a lot, but I think season two is the strongest part of so weird in general. I don't know. That, maybe that's just me. <laughs> no, definitely. Because season two is where we really get into the story arc and the mystery of what really happened to Rick. Why did he die? Where is he now? What's drawing Fiona into exploring the paranormal? Yeah. It seems what the show is about crystallizes more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do we have it? So are these like our final thoughts on season one? Oh, do we want to do like a, a little retrospective on season one real quick? <laughs> well, I was going to do my, you know, since I don't do rankings, I was just going to mention my top five So Weird episodes from season one. Just list them all. Sure. Yeah, well, look, okay. I've got that. Li- I've got a list too. Let me just bring that up real quick. You go ahead. Okay. So as you all know, I don't do rankings, but I, or I don't do ratings for each episode, but I have been doing a ranking of the episodes as we've gone along. And uh, my top five So Weird Season 1 episodes are, number one, Rebecca, number two, Will of the Wisp, number three, Angel, number four, Sacrifice, and number five, Singularity. I'm a little bit surprised about this. I wasn't expecting Singularity to be at number five, but that's how the chips lay down, so... All right, I'm looking at uh, my list here. Um, Rebecca is also my number one. Uh, Mm -hmm. Number two, Angel. Number three, Sacrifice. Number four, Escape. And number five, Will of the Wisp. Okay, so we've got, you know, four of the same episodes. I'm surprised that Sacrifice made it into your top fives. I never looked at Sacrifice as that great. I like Bigfoot. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that would do it. I always hated the tale of Bigfoot. I think my top five would be Rebecca, definitely number one, Will of the Wisp, Family Reunion, um, Singularity is definitely up there. I love Mad Max. Yes, that's previously established. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And one more, Tulpa. Tulpa has to be up there because that was the first episode to ever give me nightmares. So Tulpa would be my number five. Yeah, Tulpa's my number six. It's uh, it's actually at the bottom uh, of season one for me. <laughs> see, an escape is down at the bottom of season one for me. So it, wait, you, say you escape said escape? Is in your top five? Hmm? Yeah, escape is in my top five. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. So, <laughs> okay. Interesting. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that Emily you brought up that you think that the running theme in season one is the relationship between Jack and Fee, because I think that's a core part of why those episodes are my favorite episodes. 
I love the relationship that Jack and Thea have developed. And I think he is such an important character to her on her journey. Yeah, definitely. And you're right. I didn't really notice that, but they did have some nice moments in mm, almost all of the, my top five episodes. Um, I'll pick a top three because I can't think of five. But it'll definitely be Rebecca as the first one, second, and Angel as the third. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't hear. What did you say was second? It cut out. Oh, um, Willow the Wisp. Okay. Well, it seems yeah. like we can agree on a lot of a lot of those. Like everybody yeah, the likes top two. Everybody loves Angel, so. Not me. <laughs> well, everybody <laughs> but you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do we have any feedback or anything? Yeah, I'm getting that out right now. I just can't believe Escape is in your top five. That's just. Whatever. Same. Let's not, I'm not like bashing your opinion. It's probably your opinion. It's just, wow, that's interesting. It's just interesting how different opinions can vary in yeah. our fandom. I, I don't know. It might have been different if I had done that list today. It's a, it's an old list. But. Oh. but I think it's pretty unanimous that Rebecca is the best episode of season one. If not the best episode of the entire series. Yes. In my opinion, yes. And probably because it's the best, one of the best songs of the series. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, music is a totally different topic, but I mean, it's definitely a great yeah, song. Yeah, I just think that we should take a look back at the songs we got out of season one. So we got Rebecca, we got In the Darkness, we got to see the development of She Sells. Is that it? And More Like a River. Oh, briefly, yeah, we do hear that a little bit, don't we? Yeah, at the end of Memory. Um, hmm. well, I mean, out of those songs, I mean, Rebecca's definitely my favorite. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, my, my favorite song out of the soundtrack, if you could call it that, is um, uh, Love is Broken. And that doesn't come along till season two, so. First favorite would be Rebecca. Second favorite, More Like a River. I love that song, too. That's a, that's a wonderful one. That always yeah. makes me misty-eyed. I love almost all of the songs in season one and two. Um, there are only a couple that I don't care for very much but we will talk about that eventually i think the only song in season one that i don't care for is lorena and that's not so weird song it doesn't really count no. <laughs> no it doesn't count but i remember i was able to bootleg it off of a so weird fan site years ago so i had it and i had it listed as a so weird song and then i go skip it okay so so, so, <laughs> <laughs> so we got actually quite a bit of comments in between our recording sessions, um, one is fandom. <laughs> one is for our episode nine of Rebecca by Alona. I think that's how you say it. She said, "This was a beautiful episode. The historical travel aspect of the story spoke to me as a kid, and in some way made it more realistic to think they were around in the past and had developed a method for survival." The theme also reminded me of the book Tuck Everlasting, at least in hinting on the difficulties presented by an individual or family living forever when the larger world does not. The song is in my top two favorites from the show, second to The Rock, which were easily some of my favorite songs in general when I was young. I still love them and feel like even now I'm unable to have an unbiased perspective on them as musical pieces because they had such an emotional impact from the context of the show. I appreciated that Molly's songs always related to her specific experiences. I don't know too many sh other shows with a lot of serious original music. All other musical Disney and other shows seem to have much lighter fare. But having a middle-aged adult rather than a teenager be the primary musician on this show, well, for a while, seemed to allow for some of the deepest musical acts I've seen on television. Amen. <laughs> that was so beautifully written. Yeah, that was good. Great letter. I, I, I'm always impressed with the level of feedback we get on the show. The, the So Weird fandom is so passionate. They're always very eloquent. Yeah, because yeah. I think the show is so eloquent. And as she said, these songs, like, they're real and relatable. And they reach that raw level of emotion that you don't get from other Disney Channel songs. Uh, you can really tell how specific episodes um, just touched a lot of fans in a lot of similar and a lot of different ways because you try to think of other shows where so many episodes can you know reach someone on a deep level like that and I think it's a 
that they pointed out that the musician is an adult instead of you know one of the teen characters is a good point because that does totally change the perspective. I mean, it would it's a, a lot different. Um, I mean, if you had a you know, I mean, if for Disney were, for example, to bring in a like some sort of bubblegum pop teen singer to record a bunch of goofy, upbeat love songs, that would be totally at odds with the characters and the tone of the series so far. So it was a much better decision <laughs> than what they did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't hear any bitterness there, Zach. <laughs> bitter? No, never. Never bitter. <laughs> we can't go an episode. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Yeah, uh... That was a really great comment. Thanks for commenting, and I hope you've been enjoying all of our other episodes. And that was on YouTube. Another one from YouTube from Kenisu3000 for our Strangeling episode. They said, only 5 out of 10 or 6 out of 10. Boy, I am in a different camp. I freaking love this episode. The atmosphere is right up my alley, especially the effect of keeping the dragon half in shadows and like you said it's great to get so much set up for later material you mentioned molly and john bantering in strange geometry about groupies i didn't realize until my last watch of that episode that molly teasing john over always giving band jackets away to groupies is foreshadowing the end of the episode after fee's just been told the truth about rick and john drapes her in a jacket to comfort her i thought that was a great little touch once i realized it was there been thoroughly enjoying these podcasts and i'm trying to catch up very excited for the will of the wisp review there are tons of great lines in that episode but perhaps surprisingly i think my favorite has to be it's sweet you know you're toasted kara's delivery there just nails it it's one of those great fist bump lines yeah i hope you're not too disappointed in this episode (laughs) (laughs) don't say that but that's true there are so many great lines like mischievous monkeys I yeah, love that, that phrase now. Um, that one, and I just like the the name Little Duck. And Me too. Fee, yeah, Fee has a lot of good lines. I like how she says, um, by the rules of Celtic magic, you do. And just the way to, they deliver things, it's great. And I like how sassy she is when she says, oh, and by the way, I won't need the whole hour. And then she like, <laughs> yeah. kind of just head to it like, Boom. Yeah, some good sash there. Yeah. Yeah. I also feel like we need to, or maybe I just need to take the time to gift this episode because this episode is like a gold mine for reaction gifts. Like Jack (laughs) as Brick Rue doing the whole shh thing to Fee. Oh, yeah. uh, The marching as president. There's just so much here. (laughs) Okay. Well, okay. Now, before we wrap up, I, I have. Uh, this is really a question directed. Wait, are, to, are we wrapping up? <laughs> oh, I, well, I don't, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I just want to throw this out here. Um, okay. You know, Cat is our fandom historian, I think, and um, you've mentioned it from time to time, uh, and it's gross, and I got to bring it up. Uh, there are people out there who romantically ship Fiona and Brickroot. Yes. This one, <laughs> <laughs> not really. This oh. one was just a crack ship. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that from the random ships video? I, I have no idea. I think I um, <laughs> I seem to remember some fan fiction site listing Fiona slash Brickru as a, a ta- as an option. Oh, that might have just been like relationship wise, but not like romantic relationship wise. Well, that, that's I know possible. During our first So Weird live stream go around, we made it our mission when Gabby was with us to come up with as many crack ships as we possibly could. We were shipping everything. That's how we got to ship Clue with a cow and Angel. <laughs> and that's how we got to start shipping Fiona and Brick Rio. Oh, so, oh I, so it's a joke. Oh, wow. I yeah, it was a oh. joke. Oh, good. good oh, good. wait. Don't be calling it a joke. There's going to be some... The Brie Crew fans who pop up in our, <laughs> our comments and tear us apart, okay? Yeah, I've been, so I've been that waiting. is what inspired me to do the So Weird Random Ship series of videos. I am continually continuing to work on the third in the series, but I believe it was the second video, So Weird Random Ships 2, where I did do a video for Fee and Brie Crew. All right. Well, I've been waiting for the negative comments. You know, all of our feedback so far has been really nice and friendly, and I've been waiting for some very, you know, bitter, angry, like, 
you know, pissed off Annie fans coming for our heads or something. I've been waiting for that. Wait until wait until season three. That'll happen, <laughs> especially with me talking. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so we also got other feedback. Oh, how good! There's more. We got, we got a lot of feedback. I think because it's just been a while since we've recorded. Let's look for that. Uh, but the person who commented, uh, Kenisu, he mm -hmm. did the fee fan art, and I just wanted to tell him thank you. I love it oh. so much. Yeah, I saw that on the forum. There's not mm -hmm. nearly enough fan art of the series. Yeah, hint, hint, listeners, <laughs> give us your if fan art, talk. please. Oh, I love it so much. Yeah, that was really great fan. Okay, so we got some uh, feedback on our last episode for Lost on Tumblr from very own personal blog. They said, it's okay that you guys didn't connect to this episode. When I saw this episode as a child, my, my friends and I cried. I think a lot of people connected with this episode because it reminds them of the time their loved ones went into a coma. I know the brainwave communication made it silly, unbelievable, but gives people hope. A lot of people talk to people in comas hoping that he or she is somehow listening because it might be the last chance to say goodbye. I thought about this episode when I read an article about a man who was in a coma for 12 years. When he woke up and went through the physical therapy, he revealed that when he was in a coma, he was aware of everything around him. He heard his mother tell him he wished he would just die. His mother felt bad about it, but he forgave her. Oh, wow. Mm. That's a really insightful comment. Thank you for the person who wrote that. Yeah, that was that was great. I think that just goes I, I, to show how think, important the show is in terms uh -huh, of connecting with how, people. Yeah, I didn't think how that hope from, you know, if someone was in a coma that they were listening and how they could possibly talk to them or hear them. Yeah, that just brought me to an entirely new perspective on Lost. Yeah, that was a uh, great feedback. <laughs> Okay, and I think there's like two or three more. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so weird fandom, keeping it going. They've been busy. This is why I post it everywhere. <laughs> okay, so this one's from Andrea on our Facebook page. She said, great podcast. Rest assured, I am not at all disappointed with this episode review. I And I appreciate hearing other people's opinions on these episodes. I look forward to your review of Willow the Wisp. I imagine that episode must have been a lot of fun for Patrick Levis putting on a Scottish accent and acting like he is possessed by a wisp. There is something humorous about the skeptic being possessed by a creature of the paranormal. And the fact that Fiona really seems to think the Wisp might be telling the truth when he tells her that all she needs to do to be rid of him is shout be gone from this mortal form. She should have known it would not be that easy. Which makes it all the more hilarious when the Wisp teases her for believing him. Oh, that's good. We didn't touch on that. So many requests for this episode. <laughs> yeah, it's because this episode is so good. Because it's such a good one. It's our number two episode. <laughs> yeah, I like what she said about yeah. and the skeptic being possessed. That's something I hadn't really considered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then that also crops up again in Destiny when Brickery returns. And Fiona thinks like, oh no, it's coming for Jack again. So she tries to protect Jack and Jack's just like, what are you doing? Get off of me. <laughs> <laughs> Is there uh, more feedback? Um, no, I think that's it. Okay, okay. Hopefully, I didn't miss anyone. But yeah, um, thanks for all that feedback. Oh yeah, absolutely, guys. Keep it coming. I, I'm so pleased to hear that so many people are listening and enjoying. And that the fandom's still going strong. Well, I mean, people out there are... I don't know, do you think new people are rediscovering So Weird in 2016? I mean, I, I Definitely. I guess. We've met people all over the forum who come over, and, like, they're teenagers just learning about the show from the first time. So it is yeah, reaching a new generation. Yeah, we still people joining it. Yeah, people are joining it. People are showing their siblings, their younger siblings, the show. and They're liking it still. Well, good. I'm glad it's uh, still reaching people, even though it's you know never been released or anything. Yeah, maybe other yeah. countries too, because I've seen like videos of so weird in like Spanish or Portuguese or something, where it's much better quality than the Disney Channel rips that we have. So maybe it's still living in other countries. 
I don't think it's still living in other countries, but it was probably shown over there. Yeah, so it might have been shown like later than it was here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. K Paro? I don't. It's K something. It's R A R O. I don't oh, know. Okay, I, I know. I know. Kathy said it once. Yeah, Yeah, There's that one, but I also have this other one. It's a different title. When yeah. the downloads that I have. Pro? Yeah, that. Yeah. Maybe one's por Portuguese. Is one Portuguese? I don't know. Well, I know that um, somebody on uh, before the uh, the HD rips of the songs leaked. Somebody had uploaded a Brazilian person had uploaded a lot of songs from the series. So there probably is a Portuguese version then out there. Yeah. All right. So is there anything else we want to say about this one? <laughs> I think we're done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So thank you for joining us all the way through season one of So Weird. As soon as we can, we'll be back with all new reviews for season two. So I am Katz. I'm Kathy. I'm Zach. And I'm Emily. Keep the faith. Never happy give up on So Weird. Bye, everyone. And happy Thanksgiving. Pulling me on a downward slide In the darkness is a lie Getting hot the deeper I go In the darkness is a lie Into the darkness down below In the darkness is, is a light Now the ghosts come dancing by In the darkness is a lie Out of the shadows of my life Darkness is a lie. All of my losses, none of my wins. In the darkness is a lie. Why do I have to face them again? Beautiful.